Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very interesting one entitled Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing in His Mission. And once again, I like to emphasize the His mission. It's His job. We just cooperate according to His design, according to His plan. We cooperate. And this lesson, as we're nearing the end of the series, is entitled, A Message Worth Sharing. It's lesson number 12 for September 19 of 2020. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, it certainly is a message worth sharing. The truth about you is what gives us hope. It's the, everything to the Christian's life and to his hopes. We know that the day is coming soon when you will be back to collect those who have this hope. May we be a part of that group as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As a church, we Seventh-day Adventists believe that our primary mission is to present to the world the three angels' messages of Revelation 14, 6 through 12. Do we understand those messages? Do we know how to present them in a winsome way? What do they say about Jesus? Uh, many of you are probably aware that Billy Graham, one of the world's great evangelists, used to love to use the third angel's message as his key verse for the fires of hell. Well, we're going to talk about that. So what do these things say about Jesus? If the book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ and a revelation from Jesus Christ, what does that tell us? Well, Christ's life and death were supposed to be the benefit for the benefit of every person and every being who has ever lived. The gospel reaches out to every language, group, culture, and societal background. It tells us that Jesus won. Jim? Christ was treated as we deserve, that, you, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 5-6. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 52. 25. Let's give him page 25, verse, uh, paragraph 2. I'm sorry. Okay. Carrie? But the plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. To this result of his great sacrifice, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion crucifixion rather, he said, now is the judgment of this world, now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. It's John 12, 31, 32. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe, it would justify God and his Son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God and would reveal the nature and the results of sin. That's from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 68, paragraph 2 through page 69. I want to, I want to make a comment here. You notice when she quotes John 12, 31 and 32, she says, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Didn't she leave something out? Oh, not man. According, not according to the Greek. Not Greek according does not to the have men in there. The King James translator, not understanding of the great controversy, put the word, word men in there. And if you notice in the King James yeah. that it's in italics, meaning that it wasn't there in the original. So what happens when we quote Ellen White in more recent studies? Back about the year 2000, 
I was back at Princeton Theological Seminary with a Bible Collector Society, and uh, Dr. Bruce Metzger, the general editor of the RSV, used that verse as he was going to explain how Bible translators do their work. And he chose that verse. Oh, boy. And so anyway, I was at the back of the room, and I raised my hand. I said, maybe it would have been better if they left the word men out, and then it would have been more in keeping with what Paul says in Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and 3, 9 and 10. Went over like a lead balloon. Yeah, nobody they didn't <laughs> you know, didn't, didn't know where I was coming from. You yeah, know. yeah. If you don't have an, if you don't have the great controversy. Yeah. But it would have been more in harmony with what Paul says. Exactly. It, it is, uh, well, so the next time you read that verse, leave the word out, men out. <laughs> there are two main focal points in the history of the Bible. One, the first coming of Jesus, and two, the second coming of Jesus, which is, of course, is, is still future. How are these messages relevant to us today? We believe that God is love. We believe and teach that God loves each one of us. God knows what is coming even in our day. So as we look back over the biblical history, we see that in places like Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 and Amos 3, 7, which I'm going to quote, look at this. The sovereign Lord never does anything without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. God promised that he will tell us what is coming in advance. This is not so we can write tomorrow's newspapers. Instead, it is so that as John 13, 19, let's look at that. I tell you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you do what? You will believe that I am who I am. So what's Jesus saying? This is not so that you somehow know what's going to happen before it happens. It's so that when it does happen, you're going to what? Your faith is going to increase because you realize that God knew exactly what was coming long ago. In advance. The expression present truth is precious and very important to Seventh-day Adventists. Gary? No, it's me. Oh, I'm sorry. Charles? Second Peter. 1, chapter 1, verse 12 through 15. And so I will always remind you of these matters, even though you already know them and are firmly grounded in the truth you have received. I think it only right for me to stir up your memory of these matters as long as I'm still alive. I know that I shall soon be put off, soon put off this mortal body, as our Lord Jesus Christ plainly told me, I'll do my best then to provide a way for you to remember these matters the time after my death. This is from the American Bible Society. Okay, and then Second, uh, second Peter. The same passage from King James Version. Okay, this is King James, right. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put away put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Okay, be established in the present truth. What do we mean by present truth? The message as we understand it now. Message as we understand it now, that's correct. Yeah. Truth, truth is solid, but our understanding of the truth Grow. is progressive. Uh, it, someone, I mean, I've heard this growing up says, truth is progressive. Huh? No, truth is truth. Christ is truth. It's our perception of it truth. It is our perception of, yeah. of truth. Yeah. yeah. Is. Well, for example, yeah. well, we, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> Forgive me. For, I was gonna... Well, remember that one of the first, news, first papers that he had been present put truth. out was entitled well, present, present Truth. truth. Yes. So, as we continue to study, as we learn more, the truth, I mean, this has certainly been true in my life, it expands, it grows every, I mean, every day, hopefully. However, it does not dilute. That's very no, important. it doesn't change the it truth. It does not change. No. no. Ever a f friend of ours that uh, years ago says, if we have a worship, the same picture of God this year that we had last year, we are worshiping an idol. We have a graven image.
-hmm. We're talking about the infinite one. And the infinite one, sh or sh understand you should be constantly expanding. Yeah. And more is, life is happening, more things we can see. However, to the law and to the testimony. Yes, the testimony. That is yeah. important that we've got to Okay, know. so what was present truth to Peter and his friends in their day? Christ died. Yeah, the story of Christ, the life of Christ, the death of Christ, and all that that prefigured or, or pre yeah, represented. And what's present truth in our day? Same. Same, Same thing, thing, except right. that in our context, it's the pre-advent judgment, right? Yes. But God is always free and fair. He gives each one of us an opportunity to choose whether we are we want to live a life like his life when which when he was on this earth or if we want to die the death he died separated from his father and our father. And so these key verses are are there Romans 3:23 and 6:23. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. For sin pays its wages, its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life and union with Christ Jesus our Lord. So the book of Revelation that we're focusing on right at the moment completely baffles many people. They do not understand the beasts or the symbols, but it is possible for those who take time to study Revelation carefully to see the grand overall theme. There's some churches that just ignore it. Yeah, completely. They say, don't even read it. It's just too mystic. You'll never understand it. We're not yep. supposed to know. Just forget it. So what would you say if someone asked you, what is going to happen to our world? Is the message of Revelation, especially Revelation 12 through 14, clear in your mind? Remember that Revelation 14, 6 through 12, known as the Three Angels' Messages, is supposed to be our end time message for the world. Are we sharing it? Are we sharing it in a winsome manner? We, we must not be in the old time, end times then. I'm sorry, I just couldn't help mm -hmm. it. No, we should really truly be, be speaking on this more yeah. and more. Mm -hmm. While the gospel is focused primarily on the first coming of Jesus, the book of Revelation is almost entirely focused on his second coming. Each of the major prophetic groupings, now if you remember the book of Revelation, you know there's sevens and sevens and sevens and sevens. And each one of those sevens, you find out, ends with the second coming. Each one focuses that it sort of, sort of builds up and there we are at the second coming. And then the next one builds up and there we are at the second coming. The next one builds up and there we are at the second coming. So, look at Revelation 1-7. Jim? Look, he is coming on in the, excuse me, look, he is coming on the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him so shall it be. Good news, Bible. Okay. Well, you can look at other places in Revelation 11, 15, 14, 14 to 20, and 19, 11 to 18 to, to talk about the judgment. These passages and others in Revelation encourage us to come and learn the truth about God. The book of Revelation also spells out many of the details of the devil's deceptions down through the ages. We can rest assured that God's plan will succeed. God has never failed, Amen. although it might seem like it. When Jesus was dead, hanging, buried in a tomb, it might have seemed like Jesus failed, right? And so he encourages us to say, along with the angels, these words. This is Revelation 22, verse 7, 12, 17, and 20. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. Happy are those who obey the prophetic words in this book. Listen, says Jesus, I am coming soon. I will bring my rewards with me to give each one according to what he has done. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Everyone who hears this must also say, Come. Come, whoever is thirsty, accept the water of life as a gift whoever wants it. He who gives his testimony to all this says, Yes, indeed, I am coming soon. So be it. Come, Lord Jesus, as from the Good News Bible. Wow. So everybody is supposed to be saying what? Come. 
Lord, yeah. come. That's what we're talking about, witnessing. Come. I have a friend who says the, we can summarize the book of Revelation in one word, come. So why do you think several New Testament authors suggested that Jesus is coming very soon? And you can even go back in the Old Testament. Uh, Joel, second coming is very soon. Does 2,000 years seem like soon? Or even very soon? Does that make it hard to convince our friends to take the book of Revelation seriously? Well, the very center of the book of Revelation, if you could spread it out here and just exactly measure the exact center of it, it turns out to be the very exact center of Revelation 12. We know that Revelation 12 to 14 go together. It's a, it's a unit. Chapter 12 gives us a bird's eye view of the great controversy from the beginning of the, revel of the rebellion in heaven all the way down basically to the second coming. Chapter 13 presents Satan's side in that great controversy. And he is, is there's some scary things in that chapter. Chapter 14 presents God's answers to Satan's challenges, and it is our job to carry God's answers to the world. Following the giving of God's answers as recorded in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, we see in verses 14 to 20 of Revelation 14 that it is time for the grain and the grapes to be harvested. And if we had time, we would read Matthew 13, 37 to 43 and Mark 4, 20. We can read Mark 4, 20. Now. Let's just look at that. When the corn is ripe, the man starts cutting with his sickle because harvest time has come. And that's basically the message of, of a math of 13 as well. Compare these two passages with Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And there we have 14, 7. We got, I think, Charles, that is yours. I think you've got something I have. Sing with a loud voice, fear God, and give glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of water. There's an interesting question that arises in the interpretation of Revelation 14, 7. What does the hour of His judgment mean? Does it mean, as many have suspected, that the time has come for God to judge us? Or in the light of Romans 3, 4, we'll look at in a moment, does it mean that the hour for us to be judged? So just to does judge it mean him. The to be judged, or the hour for, for the God to be judged, or both? Are we being judged, or is God being judged, or both? So Romans 3, 4, God must be true, even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when to speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Good and who's news, being tried? God. God. God is being tried. Is he's talking? He's, Paul is talking to God. His, his, the record of his dealings with his creatures is before the universe. Mm -hmm. And the example I, I give to illustrate that is, think about the work of a human judge here in our system here in America. It's not exactly the same in every country, but our system in America here is judges, they will all tell you that their job is to correctly interpret the law. They will always say that. But we know that there are some who have a leaning in one direction and others have a leaning in the other direction. See? Interpretation. Interpretation. So that comes to interpretation. So what happens when we judge God? Some choose to rebel against him. Some choose to join him, join his side. So what's happening? Well, we are judging God's judgments, right? I mean, just as we judge a judge's judgments, we judge him based on his judgments. We human beings are now making a decision about God based on what we know about him. So, when Revelation chapter 13 is put into, is enforced, mm -hmm. could it be that many people who had no idea of the character of God says, wow, I want to be with him. And they could be whatever of any church or not even belong mm -hmm. to church. Yeah. It says, no, this makes sense. I want to be with him. Yeah. 
I think I think the truth is going to be that that uh, the truth about God will be pre be presented in, on television, in the newspapers, all kinds of ways on the radio because they will be tri on trial for their lives, and they will give their witness as they're being on trial and as it, these things are being discussed before judges, and people listening in to these trials will say, "Wow." Now that appeals to me. Right. So in a, Revelation 14, 6 through 12, the three angels' messages are a rallying cry for Seventh day Adventists. In a special sense, Seventh day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a <clears throat> perishing world. On them is a shining, wonderful light. On them is shining, wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There was no other work of, of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Testimonies, Volume 9, page 19, by Ellen White. Now, may I? Yes. Uh, this is from experience. Uh, we don't need to go to the Christian communities to preach Adventism to them. Uh, we have been given the most beautiful health message and the whole world, by the way, is hurting and the, the horrible misery that we export from this country to the <laughs> entire world um, is, an, is an absolute opportunity for us some Adventists to present Christ in His real divine beauty through our health message and then present the truth. Yeah, wouldn't it be marvelous? Well, look at Revelation 14, 6. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an ever eternal message of God, of good news, to announce to the people's earth and to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, honor God. Well, if you read the King James, it says, fear God. So, what's that all about? What does it mean to fear God? Could it be to be in awe of God? Mm-hmm. To be in awe of God is the beginning of wisdom, but that doesn't mean it's all wisdom. It's, it's just a good starting place. To fear God has to do with how we think. It is an appeal to live to please God and place Him first in all of our thoughts. It is an attitude of obedience that leads us to live godly lives. This message also invites us to give glory to God. Giving glory to God relates to what we do in every aspect of our lives. How much time have you committed to understanding and spreading the truth about the three angels' messages? What has God told us about our responsibilities? 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and who has given you to you by God? You do not belong to yourselves but to God. He bought you for a price. So use your bodies for God's glory, as from the Good News Bible. In an age of moral irresponsibility, when millions of people feel that they are accountable to no one but themselves, this Judgment Hour message reminds us that we are responsible for our actions. There is a relationship between an attitude of reverence for God, obedience to God, and the judgment. Obedience is the fruit of a saving relationship with Jesus. Only His righteousness is good enough to pass the judgment, and in His righteousness we are secure. Through His righteousness we live to glorify His name in all that we do. And that's from the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Wednesday, September 16. So how many, in, in how many different ways are we supposed to worship God? Well, certainly one of the main ways is in how we relate to Him during the Sabbath hours, which are set aside for worshiping Him. And uh, there are many verses about that. Of course, the most famous one would be the fourth commandment in Exodus 28 through 11. But there's others. For example, Revelation 14, it says, 1411, Our Lord and God, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by your will, they were given ex existence and life. So that's a good enough reason to worship God, right? It should be no surprise to any of us that in light of God's plan for the Holy Sabbath, Satan has attacked it 
in every way that he can imagine. All the way back 2,000 years ago, in the days of John, God recognized that there would be many different churches alive in our world. He also recognized that there would be many forms of deception that we need to avoid. Charles? Revelation chapter 14, verse 8. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She made all people drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 to 6. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on the red beast that had names insulting to God written all over it. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and covered with gold ornaments, precious stones and pearls. In her hand she held a gold cup full of obscenity and filthy things, the result of her immorality. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. If you go back to Revelation 12, you discover that there is a beast who is red or scarlet in color, who, is seven, who has seven heads and ten horns, and who is it? It's really Satan. It, the it's devil Satan. himself. The devil himself. So this woman is riding on the devil himself, and she's pretending to be a church. Woman in the, in the New Testament represents a church. So what kind of a church would be riding on the devil? False church. Well, read on. On her forehead was written a name that has a secret meaning. Great Babylon, the mother of all prostitutes and perverts the world. And I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's people and the blood of those who were killed because they had been loyal to Jesus. Is it possible that there is a professedly Christian church that has killed many, many, and many of God's faithful children? Yeah. Hmm. Uh -huh. There's a question. Diana? Revelation 18, 1 to 4. After this, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven. He had great authority, and his splendor brightened the whole earth. He cried out in a loud voice. She has fallen. Great Babylon has fallen. She is now haunted by demons and unclean spirits. All kinds of filthy and hateful birds live in her. For all the nations have drunk her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. The kings of the earth practiced sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the world grew rich from her unrestrained lust. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out, my people, come out of her. You must not take part of her sins. You must not share in her punishment. And that's from the Good News Bible. In the book of Revelation, the term Babylon represents a false system of religion based on human works, man-made traditions, and false documents. Doctrine. Doctrines. It exalts human beings and her self-righteousness above Jesus and his sinless life. It places the commands of human religious teachers above the commands of God. Babylon was the center of idolatry, sun worship, and the false teaching of the immorality of the soul. Immortality, the, not immorality, sorry. Immortality of the soul, probably a little of both there. This false <laughs> religious system has suddenly <laughs> integrated many of the ancient Babylon religious practices into its worship. God's last day message to our dying planet is the message of Jesus and his righteousness. It echoes heaven's appeal. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. Revelation 18, 2 and 4. God has divinely raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church to exalt the message of Christ in all of its fullness. To exalt Jesus is to lift up everything he taught. It is to proclaim the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. It is to expose the heirs of Babylon in contrast to the truth of Jesus. And that's from the Adult South School lesson on Thursday, September 17. Okay. 
Well, we already suggested that Revelation 13 talks about Satan's side in the great controversy. What he's going to do, and it suggests that the whole world is going to wander after him. We'll read it in just a moment, or part of it here. Revelation 14 is God's response. Now, God's faithful church would normally be teaching God's response in the great controversy, right? Wouldn't that follow naturally? So look at this. Several very important facts should be apparent. One, Satan will use several assistants in his efforts to deceive and confuse humans. So in Revelation 13, we find out there's two beasts that arise. And those two beasts having arisen, we don't read anything more about Satan until we get all the way over to, Revel to chapter 17, the end of chapter 16 and 17. Satan seems to have disappeared, but his his associates are busy, okay? Two, his efforts will be inordinately successful. Revelation 13 says in effect that everyone will wonder, wonder after the beast. Three, but then Revelation 14 talks about God's responses to these claims from the devil. And God tells us clearly that we must come out from those deceptive practices and organizations and worship the true coming King. Correct me if I'm wrong. None of the uh, reformers believed in the immortality of soul. Ooh. I would have to do some work. I, you take one of the other one. Okay, I'm, I, I just want, but would, would one know one thing now mm -hmm. that, uh, that all of the Protestant churches except for some Adventists. Yeah. Everyone follows immortally. I mean, you read it, you well, hear is, it, and everyone. Hell is a precious doctrine to them because yeah. it gets them to pay part with their uh, fire insurance premium, their offerings. Uh, <laughs> but you see, I mean, uh, this, is, this is unbelievable. As yeah. it were possible, they would, Satan would deceive. Yeah. That yeah. type of as well as one of the unique teachings about Adventism, that, that they, is they, they, what is it, the perpetuity of the law, in other yeah. words, a, a yeah. different stuff, and that the wicked are not going to be tortured for eternity. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Well, God tells us clearly that we must come out from those deceptive practices and organizations, worship the true coming king. This will not be easy. Revelation 14, 12 says, this calls for endurance. What's endurance? It means you up. struggle at it, and you keep working at it, and you keep working at it, and you keep working at it, right? It calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay. Uh, God has called his church in this day as he called ancient Israel to stand as a light in the earth. By the mighty cleaver of truth, the messages of the first, second, and third angels he has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself. He has made them the depositaries of his law and has committed to them the great truths of prophecy for this time. And how many churches, even Christian churches in our day, are talking about the prophecies? None. No, they really, truly, I, I interact with, uh, no one cares for especially Revelation. Mm -hmm. They don't. Oh, we, we have Christ. We have the love of Christ. We don't need mm -hmm. anything any, anymore. Yeah. Wow. Um, like the holy oracles committed to ancient Israel, these are a sacred trust to be communicated to the world. The three angels of Revelation 14 represent the people who accept the light of God's messages and go forth as his agents to sound the warning throughout the length and breadth of the earth. Christ declares to his followers, ye are the light of the world. Now, of course, our whole series of lessons is on witnessing, right? Mm -hmm. Ye are the light of the world. Mm -hmm. What do we mean to say we are the light of the world? Does that mean we hide ourselves in a back closet somewhere? No, we're supposed to be out there. Yeah, we're supposed yeah. to be representing the truth. We're supposed to be living it and preaching it, right? Yeah. To every soul that accepts Jesus, the cross of Calvary speaks, Behold the worth of the soul. Go ye into all the world 
and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16, 15. Nothing is to be permitted to hinder this work. It is the all-important work for our time. It is to be far-reaching uh, as eternity. The love that Jesus manifested for the souls of men and the sacrifice which he made for their redemption will actuate all his followers. Testimonies, Volume 5, 455 to 456. Jim, I think we're going to ask you to do the next one. Christ there. accepts, oh so gladly, every human agency that is surrendered to him. He brings the human into union with the divine, <clears throat> that he may communicate to the world the mysteries of incarnate love. <clears throat> Talk it, pray it, sing it. Fill the world with messages, excuse me, with the message of his truth, and keep pressing on into the regions beyond. Ellen White Testimonies, Volume 9. Why do you think God has found it necessary to ask us to set aside one-seventh of our time to worship and honor Him? Is that really necessary? It's not for, it's for our benefit. It's He could do some teaching, mm -hmm. and uh, we could do some learning and communicating and get together Amazing with each idea. other. Rejuvenation. Yeah. 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 Yep. Well, uh, well, let's go to Isaiah 58. Mm -hmm. If you call the Sabbath a delight, delight. we do. That's beautiful. Whoa. Also, there's a t in, in uh, Isaiah 58, the, the uh, fasting is, is uh, I should look that up here. It's a, it's a good definition of fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, quickly here, Isaiah 58. Behold, the day of your fast, you shall seek your oppression. Uh, where is it? Oh, me. It is not this fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. It is not to share your bread with the hungry. Give me, is it not to share your bread with the hungry and break the homeless poor into your house when you seek the, the naked to cover him? This is a type of fast. Not go hungry for yourself. For, uh, per, what verse time. does that start with? I, uh, verse 6, Isaiah 58, 6. Uh, no, 13 and 14. You're reading, you're reading Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. Well, it was up here, verse 6 on my Bible. Is it? Isaiah 58, verse 6. Is not the fast that I choose to, lo uh, to loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free? Okay. And then as you go down, of course, then if you call the Sabbath a delight. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a quotation <laughs> right. that uh, right. Charles has mentioned. Right, uh, right. But I would just, we never, t uh, if I just f found that, some, or somebody else pointed that no, out to me some time ago. We desperately need to take the time on Sabbath, not just to relax and rest and talk to our family and friends, but to learn more about God. Amen. That's the purpose of the primary purpose of the Sabbath, and to share what we know about God. Some people might think that uh, taking a sleep on Sabbath is as lay activities on the yes, Sabbath. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, in Revelation thirteen fourteen, we read about the mark of the beast and the seal of God, and in several places in Scripture, the seal of God has been identified as the seventh day Sabbath. It includes our full understanding of all the implications of believing in the true Sabbath. By contrast, the mark of the beast is Satan's end time deception. And I wish we had time to go into the details about the mark versus the seal, but uh, for those of you who get our handout, which is available free online on, at, at theox.org, that's T-H-E-O-X.org, you see it on your screen there, uh, there's an excellent presentation on the mark of the beast, and there's the the uh, link to it. You can go and watch an excellent presentation under um, Adventist World Radio. We have seen how the early disciples and the apostles were absolutely excited about presenting the gospel as they understood it. They considered it to be present truth. Didn't most of them believe that Jesus would return very soon, maybe even in their day? They did. Were they deceived? Well... It's one of those kind of deals. <laughs> I remember when I talk about, you know, I think, I, I think to myself, 
surely Jesus will come at least in my grandchildren's day. At least in my grandchildren. Maybe in my children's day, maybe in my day. I don't think we should, Ellen White one place says, we should not put off the coming of Jesus 10 or 20 years. Neither should we make it as close as two or three years. But um, I remember Uncle Arthur who wrote so many books. He was sure that Jesus would come in his day. And now he's gone and his son is, sons are gone. But he would, every time I remember, oh, which son, it was Marvin, he says, he'd send a message to Pacific Press and make some changes in the... Yeah. <laughs> yes. But I, I think to me, seeing what we are seeing now, yeah. How far more? <laughs> well, what does their revelation say about who is behind these revelations? I mean, it, do, should we be worship? Should we we be studying the Book of Revelation? I mean, who, who gave us the Book of Revelation? The Lord Himself. This Revel is the revelation of Christ. Right, or Jesus Christ. There you are, Jesus Christ. Okay, I think someone has a verse you. on that. Yes, Gary. Uh, revelation one, one to three. This book is a record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. God gave him this revelation in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him, and John has told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the truth revealed by Jesus Christ. Happy is the one who reads this book, and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what is written in this book. For the time is near when all these things will happen. Now, there's two things I want you to notice. We're going to read it again in, in, in the King James Version. Yes. But two things I want you to notice. It's very clear that it's talking about future events. There are several futures, future verbs in this, in this passage. That's number one. And two, it's all about who? Christ. Jesus Christ, Christ, about God, like this. And so, if God knows the future, and here he is, how, how, why would we ignore this book? I mean, if God says, guess what? This is what's going to happen in the future. We say, huh, no, I, we, we shouldn't study that. That's, that's too complicated. It's too mysterious. Yeah. That's the excuse with all the folk. I, they, by the way, I just can't help it but share this. The, the orthopedic surgery chief, of, he retired recently because of uh, uh, arthritis. We walked together many times. He says, Charles, I just wrote a book on the imperatives of Christ and I want to study Sabbath with you. Mm. So we already started studying Sabbath. You see, but then he says, yes, Sabbath is so very important, so very important. Bill, and I'm not going to say the last name. But anyways, um, but then say, well, you know, uh, Pentecost was on Sunday, and Jesus went to heaven. No, Jesus uh, came to life on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Therefore. Went to heaven on Sunday. There you go. He went to heaven on Sunday. See how... Even though he says uh, Sabbath is so beautiful, from he did this and he wrote a book on, from Genesis to Revelation, he says there. But they, and it's with so many Christians. However, I believe when this is going to be Revelation chapter 13 is going to come to force, and I believe that he himself is going to see it in action. Yeah. That this, many of these folk are going to wake up. Yeah. We well, go ahead. Now, here, let's hear the King James. We're continuing with Revelation 1, 1 to 3. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servant things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record, wait a minute, I've lost, <laughs> record of the word of God and of testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of his prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Okay. The everlasting gospel. I want you to just, we need to just think about the words here. The everlasting gospel must be about God because we are very late comers to the universe. 
how so many people think that the gospel is about what? How God saves you and me. Well, that's not an everlasting gospel. In terms of the, the span of the universe, we're way down here at the end. So far, it's going to be many years in the future, but so far we're right at the end of history. What's happened so far? We, were, we came along at the very end of, of what's happened so far. So an everlasting gospel must speak to the past, the present, and the future. We will spend the rest of eternity studying the plan of salvation. The death of Christ upon the cross made sure the destruction of him who has the power of death, who was the originator of sin. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. Just this very morning, I was out on my run and I ran across a passage I hadn't seen before where Ellen White talks about everything that God showed him. You know, when Moses climbed up Mount Nebo there, the peak up there, ready to die, God showed him a vision of the future all the way down to, and it's amazing what she says, all the things that God showed him. Now, he's already left the children of Israel, so he didn't have a chance to tell them about any of it. And then he, then he, of course, died, and angels buried him, and then later they came and Jesus resurrected him and took him back to heaven. And it's, it was, this was a huge battle right there between Satan and Christ, because Satan said, if he's dead, he's mine. He belongs to me. And he made all sorts of claims. And Elway talks about this, and Jesus says, I'm not going to waste my time arguing with you. Thank okay. you. <laughs> I'm not going to waste my time arguing with you. I think Jude mentions that, yeah, right? Jude mentions it, yeah. When Satan is destroyed, there will be none to tempt to evil. The atonement will never need to be repeated. And there will be no danger in another rebellion in the universe of God. That which alone can effect, effect, effectually restrained from sin in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. Fallen men could not have a home in the paradise of God without the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Shall we not then exalt the cross of Christ? The angel ascribe honor and glory to Christ for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against the evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. I never thought about it this way. That's something? Yeah, that is something. <laughs> um, Okay, where was I? Angelic perfection failed in heaven. Human perfection failed in Eden. And even paradise of the bliss. All who wish to, all who wish for security in earth and or heaven, must look to the Lamb of God. The plan of salvation, making manifest the justice of the, the love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against the defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This is Ellen White, Science of Times, December 30, 1889. That's an amazing statement. That is an amazing Absolutely statement. Absolutely amazing statement. We're going to spend the rest of eternity mm. studying the plan of salvation. It's going to provide an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds. Mm. In unfallen worlds. Not just here, in unfallen worlds. The angels are watching us, and Jim's already mentioned. Look at, look at Ephesians 1, uh, 9 and 10. Ephesians 3, 7 through 10. Colossians 1, 19 and 20. There it is, right there. This is Ellen White's expansion on those passages. Mm. That's interesting that, that January 30, 1890. 89. 89. Uh, December 30. Just, December 30, 1889 was uh, just before, or just following, right. uh, was ca came along the uh, uh, January 20, 1890. 
mm-hmm. of the his fa- her famous I shouldn't say famous famous among us yeah but the, the rest of I uh, don't understand yeah. that the Christ only way he could uh, is to re- reveal himself to to his creatures yeah yeah if you if you have access to signs of the times um, to having the little disc that you put in your computer from Alan White. Read this passage in December 30 of 1888, Signs of the Times, and read along with it, January 20, 1890. That's on egwhite.org or something. Yeah. Egwhite.org. You go, go right on the internet. You don't yeah. have to have the, the yeah. disc. Yeah. And it's uh, there. January Angelic, 20, 1890. Yeah. Angelic perfection failed in heaven. And God had to allow the sin of Lucifer to go to seed so that, and here's the issues in the great controversy, one, we as well as sinless creatures in the past and in the future can see the results of rebellion and separation from God. This is what happens when you leave God's way. Two, it is also to confirm that God allows freedom for us to choose his way or Satan's way. Sin could Rise again, theoretically. However, God will not need to let any new sin or rebellion go to seed again because the museum of sin, if we could call it that, and the museum of the plan of salvation will be preserved for all to see for all eternity. Ellen White stated the everlasting gospel in this way. The plan for our salvation was not an afterthought, a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence through times eternal. That's from Romans 16.25. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne. From the beginning, God and Christ knew of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of man through the deceptive power of the apostate. God did not ordain that sin should exist, but he foresaw its existence and made provision to meet the terrible emergency. So great was his love for the world that he covenanted to give his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3.16. The paragraph is from Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 22. Wow. Hmm. Think about that. She starts the story about the life of Christ by giving us these incredible insights. Our world is starved for genuine acceptance and love. Oh, true. The gospel provides forgiveness, belonging, grace, life-changing power. God has gone to extraordinary lengths to win back his estranged children. So the death of the martyrs can bear no comparison with the agony endured by the Son of God. And we should take larger, broader, deeper views of the life, suffering, and death of God's dear Son. Are we, do we begin to understand all the implications of the death of Christ? When the atoning sacrifice shall be viewed correctly, that's an important point. Mm-hmm. The salvation of souls will be felt to be of infinite value. In comparison with the enterprise of everlasting life, every other sinks into insignificance. But how have the counsels of this loving Savior been despised? The heart's devotion has been to the world, and selfish interests have closed the door against the Son of God. Hollow ap- hypocrisy and pride, selfishness and gain, envy, malice and passion, have so filled the hearts of many that Christ can have no room. Mm -hmm. Ellen White, 1869, one of very early pamphlets. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the the soul of his son with consternation. Actually, Jim, I thought you, I think you were supposed to read that. All his life, Christ had been publishing in a fallen world, the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now with the terrible weight of his guilt, of guilt, he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face, especially while on the cross. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood 
by man. So great was his agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 753. Now we need to stop and think about this for a moment. Christ is crucified on the cross. Think of everything he's been through since the previous night, all the trials, all the beatings, the crucifixion, everything. And yet, the, the consternation and the, the, the mental pain he felt because he couldn't, he couldn't connect in his thoughts with the Father. He couldn't perceive the Father's presence. That was so awful to him that his physical pain was hardly felt. How, how, how serious do we think about it when, oh, well, okay, I have something else to do now. I don't need to bother with God's Word. I think it really, truly really horrified him, horrified him to think that he's eternally lost. Yeah. I mean, that thought came to his mind, and I believe that then he says, it is finished. Well, I, I fought the good fight. I'm done. Yeah. But he was petrified, I believe, on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. He, his, his fear was that his separation from the Father would be eternal. He, and, and that fear of eternal separation from Christ, I mean, we, we take that as, well, well, okay, so, I mean, so many people in our world, separation from God, well, that's nothing. The first angel's message calls on us to make God supreme in our lives. Think of the world around us and what is most important to them. How could a world so centered on self ever inherit the kingdom of God and his love? Have, having God as the center of our lives will be manifest in everything that we do, including diet, dress, entertainment, and our choice of music. Revelation 14.7 is an appeal for us to choose God and not Darwin. Creation speaks of our value in God's sight. It speaks of our worth to Him. We are not alone in the universe. We are not some speck of cosmic dust. No, God created us. He fashioned us. He made us. We did not evolve. We are not a genetic accident. Creation is at the heart of all true worship. The Sabbath speaks of the Creator's love, care and the Redeemer's love. It reminds us that we are not cosmic orphans on some spinning globe of, uh, of rock. And we're running out of time here. The Sabbath is an eternal symbol of our rest in Him. How would you deal with these questions? And we don't have time to read those. What difference does the end time message make in your life? And you'll have to look at our handout to get the rest. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to think about you, to study about you, to share with you as we do at our times here together. Think about all that you've done for us and to think about uh, sending your son who lived that incredible life and died that awful death as separation from you. May we also feel terrible when we are separated from you even for a few minutes mm. is our prayer in Jesus' name.